Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tate. Hello and welcome back to Talk Dizzy to Me. I'm Dr. Danielle Tate. I'm a physical therapist who specializes in the treatment of vestibular dysfunction. And I'm joined as always by my fellow vestibuloholic, Dr. Abby Ross, who is also a vestibular physical therapist and neurologic clinical specialist who specializes in the treatment of vestibular dysfunction. So this week, we're covering one of the topics suggested to us by a listener, differential diagnosis of dizziness. This can be pretty complicated, but we're hoping we're just going to kind of touch the surface and give you a good idea on what types of questions to ask and where your brain should go when it comes to clinical decision making at the start. Uh, you know, at, at the by the sound of it, it appears this episode might only be for clinicians, but even as a patient, understanding a little bit about differential diagnosis can really help you figure out who, what could potentially be going on and what healthcare provider or providers you should be seeing to get the help you need. Right, especially since so much of the differential diagnosis aspect of what we do stems directly from the patient's story. Being able to convey what you're feeling and experiencing will be a huge help to the clinician trying to help you. So true. I mean, the patient's history can really clue us in on what we think is going on and how we want to treat it even before any testing or examination takes place. So, of course, we know there's a bajillion causes of dizziness. It's pretty much on every side effect listing for every single medication, for starters. So the first place we need to start is, well, how serious is this problem? In other words, do we think this is an emergency? As a clinician in an outpatient setting, do I need to refer this patient to a neurologist or cardiologist? Do I need to call an ambulance and send them straight to the emergency department? Yeah, so that's definitely step one, especially if you might be the first provider seeing the patient. As physical therapists, a lot of us have direct access, so there's a good chance you're seeing somebody off the street that hasn't even talked to a doctor yet. So first things first, does the patient have any new onset of neurological symptoms? Yeah, meaning double vision, difficulty with their speech, are they slurring their words, are they having trouble swallowing, are they ataxic, meaning are they uncoordinated, does their walking look uncoordinated, and next, are the patient's vital signs normal? Also, you want to evaluate the patient's mental state. Is there any confusion? Is there any altered mental status? And what about any sudden severe neck or head pain? So if you answer yes to any of these questions, then this patient really needs to be referred for further investigation as certainly a more serious cause of the dizziness or vertigo could be at play. If it's a big no for any of these new onset of neurological symptoms, then the next thing you need to figure out is exactly when the dizziness started presenting itself. So first, you'll want to ask, when did the patient's symptoms start? And this could be one of your first big clues as to if you're thinking more broadly central or peripheral involvement. Central meaning more related to a brain or a brainstem issue and peripheral meaning more related to the inner ear itself. Peripheral, peripheral will most likely be a sudden and strong reaction out of nowhere. The patient will likely be able to tell you exactly when this occurred, what they were doing, what time of day, you know, what was playing on the radio or television. I woke up and I was just so dizzy I couldn't even walk. Uh, central will most likely have a more slow, insidious onset, usually over a slower period or longer period of time. Without really a, a set known date, they might give you a range about this time or that time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the symptoms that they describe can even be a bit more vague. They're not so strong and they're not so severe. They're kind of just more lingering in the background. Yeah. So central versus peripheral. And then next, what triggers the patient's symptoms? What makes them worse? We'll break this down into three kind of broad categories here. So the first one being... Is it spontaneous? Did it occur out of nowhere? Is it exertional? For example, um, again, can it occur out of nowhere? You're just sitting still and all of a sudden this onset of symptoms comes on or exertional. Does it happen when you exercise? Does it happen when you cough or sneeze or bear down and hold your breath? 
And then the second, are their symptoms uh, positional dependent? Do they occur every time the patient lies down or sits up or rolls over, bends over and ties their shoe or looks up to grab something on a high shelf? Positional meaning head positional with respect to gravity. And then the third one, are the symptoms induced when the patient moves their head, any type of head movement? So let's break each of those three broad categories down. Uh, let's take a look at positional dependent first. So when we think about positional symptoms, we first want to identify what the symptoms um, the patient is reporting. So are they feeling more of a faint uh, feeling or is the room spinning? So if they're a little bit more faint or lightheaded, especially maybe when they first stand up out of a chair, we might be thinking orthostatic hypotension. And we really want to check their heart rate and blood pressure in different positions and their transition. So checking them out when they're lying down, maybe when they transition from lying to sitting and when they transition from sitting to standing. And you want to look for any dramatic changes there. Uh, while if they report their world is actually moving or spinning every time they change positions, like especially if they lay down or bend over, then we're probably leaning more towards one of the most common vestibular disorders, which is BVV or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Yeah, so if we are thinking BPPV, we can guide our clin clinical decision making a little more by inquiring how long the symptoms last or the vertigo lasts. So if they report, I sit up, my symptoms last under a minute, we're going to go more BPPV canal thiasis, where the otoconia or crystals are free floating in one of the semicircular canals. But if they report, I sit up and it takes a few minutes for this vertigo to go away. We're going to think more cupulothiasis, where the otoconia are actually adhered to the structure in the inner ear called the cupula. Now, there are other diagnoses that may also be related to positional changes as well. And, you know, those include migraine-associated vertigo and anxiety, to name a couple. We're going to talk about migraine-associated vertigo at another date because that one is complex in and of itself. But with the anxiety, it's really natural for anxiety to come along with vertigo. And in fact, I know I am more concerned when a patient doesn't feel a little anxious when their whole world is spinning. So I always say, it is normal for you to feel this. You should be feeling this. Something is not right. But you know, sometimes we see that even after BPPV is in remission, and there's no longer a present mechanical problem with the otoconia being out of place, the anxiety alone can bring on symptoms with positional changes that previously triggered the patient. All right, so that covers the first group of differential diagnosis related to positional symptoms. Let's move on to the spontaneous or exertional group. First thing we wanna know here again is how does the patient describe his or her symptoms? If it's more faint or lightheaded, we might be thinking that the patient needs a referral to cardiology to rule out anything like an arrhythmia. Now, if the patient describes a different kind of dizziness or vertigo or unsteadiness or anything other than that lightheaded, faint feeling, we might, or we wanna know actually how long the symptoms last again. So if it's more than a week, we're thinking this is probably something unrelated to the inner ear. But if it's less than a week, like seconds, minutes, hours, we're going to ask more questions to guide us. And when I say how long the symptoms last, I don't mean since the onset of the symptoms, I mean the duration of symptoms when they actually present. So one of those additional questions that we wanna ask is, if the patient has noticed or any changes in their hearing or has had any uh, additional testing for changes in hearing. If hearing loss is present, then we're narrowing our suspicions down even more to labyrinthitis or possibly Meniere's disease. Labyrinthitis will typically be one attack of vertigo uh, that may slowly improve over time and perhaps with a little help of vestibular rehabilitation. Meniere's tends to be more recurrent. They recover quicker in between attacks. They might have an attack here, an attack there. Uh, but the other thing that we want to keep in mind when we know hearing is involved is another syndrome called Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. And one way that we differentiate this is whether or not facial weakness is present. In labyrinthitis and Meniere's disease, they should not present with any sort of facial weakness while Ramsey-Hunt does. And I do want to mention here that... Um, diagnoses of acoustic neuromas or these small benign tumors that can grow near the vestibular nerve are also associated with hearing loss. However, 
those symptoms are typically not spontaneous or exertional. The slow growth of that neuroma or that little tumor allows for a patient to slowly compensate over time, and they'll complain more of a gradual onset of unsteadiness and imbalance accompanied by difficulty with head movements. Mm -hmm. So let's say this patient doesn't notice any change in his or her hearing. Okay, let's say it's one attack that's getting better with time. We're likely thinking vestibular neuritis, or sometimes you'll see it labeled as VN. Now, the difference between neuritis and labyrinthitis, because they pretty much present the same with one exception, and that is that labyrinthitis affects the hearing, neuritis doesn't. The reason for this is that the cochlea is affected in labyrinthitis, and the cochlea is the hearing organ. In neuritis, the cochlea is spared, which also spares hearing. Another condition that we should probably mention that has complaints of spontaneous or exertional symptoms is superior canal dehiscence. This is a condition when the patient is missing a part of the bony shell over the superior or anterior canal. Um, and this is that bony shell that surrounds the vestibular apparatus. This can create autophony, which is when the patient can hear things within their body that they shouldn't be hearing, like their own voice, their heartbeat, sometimes even chewing, or their eyeballs moving against their eyelids. Loud noises at certain frequencies can also make them feel dizzy. This will make their symptoms appear spontaneous, but it can also present as an exertional issue when the patient increases the pressure inside their body. This moves the fluid around the vestibular apparatus due to that bony opening. This creates episodes of vertigo while they're exerting themselves doing something like a valsalva or coughing or sneezing. Mm -hmm. The third category, so we've talked about spontaneous and exertional. We've talked about uh, positional. The third of when do the symptoms present is with head movement. Now, there will be some overlap between the first two categories and this one as pretty much any vestibular disorder can fall under this category because we know that the vestibular system detects head movement. So we would expect that symptoms can exacerbate with head movement. This is particularly true, though, when symptoms become more chronic or a patient experiences decompensation. Maybe a patient has something incredibly stressful occur in his or her life and symptoms now present again while they're playing tennis and turning their head back and forth or they're watching their son's basketball game, turning their head, following the game again back and forth. Or maybe they've been really uh, kind of just chilling out during a recent pandemic and haven't been moving much <laughs> because there hasn't been much to do. And all of a sudden they find that they've decompensated from where they've got themselves back from a vestibular issue before. This category will follow some of the same guidelines as before. We want to first rule out any red flags, such as neurological signs or symptoms, and then move on to whether or not the patient's hearing is affected. If the hearing is affected, we would want to know if there was a significant vertiginous episode in the past. If there was no significant episode in the past, we might think more along the lines of a acoustic neuroma. If there was a significant episode in the past, then this could be more of a flare-up of symptoms and we would think more labyrinthitis. And then again, if hearing is unaffected and there was a significant event in the past at some point, we might think more on the lines of neuritis. And at this point, we're talking more chronic, uncompensated, and decompensated issues. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we just scratched the surface here. We can go deeper and deeper, but this is a good glance at some of the most common diagnoses and a good overview on how to initially assess this patient just through the history itself. Again, we do want to put in a pin for migraine-associated vertigo. Due to its complexity, we're kind of saving that one for a whole other episode, which will also be breaking down other diagnoses kind of uh, episode by episode from both a, clinic, a clinician standpoint and also a patient perspective. Um, one, yes. thing to, yeah, one thing to Go keep ahead. in mind, too, with with this brief overview of differential diagnosis is that it's not always so straightforward. Um, you should really keep in mind that it's not uncommon for patients to have more than one diagnosis. Uh, so, you know, this could be a really muddy subjective. You can have someone come in with both labyrinthitis and BP and BV that are going to kind of present very differently. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is with the kind of the outline that we followed with this is, is 
we've built this episode around a vestibular algorithm for uh, patient history that you can actually find on vestibular.today. And we'll include a link in the show notes to it. It's kind of a brief uh, decision tree that can kind of maybe walk you through a patient if you're kind of getting into this and just want to see if they fall along the lines of some specific diagnoses. So be sure to look for that in the show notes and maybe give it a little glance over um, if you're kind of figuring out how to navigate this differential diagnosis, especially yeah. if you're a visual learner. Yeah. And even listen to the podcast while viewing the <laughs> algorithm. You'll see that there are parts of the algorithm that we left out But again, we kind of touch the major ones. And, you know, lastly, we want to leave you with a clinical pearl that is probably the most important clinical pearl when it comes to being a vestibular healthcare provider. And that is let the patient talk and make sure you are actively listening. Because as Danny always says, if you let the patient talk long enough, they'll tell you exactly what's going on. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And honestly, too, just talking to the patient and listening to them and making them feel heard is really going to help decrease their anxiety about uh, how they're feeling with all of this. Most of the time, these patients have a very hard time finding somebody who believes them or understands what they're going through. And just connecting with somebody who gets it makes a very, very big difference in their clinical outcomes. So, just listen, let them talk. I have sometimes let a patient talk 20 to 30 minutes just on history alone, and it's a big help. Um, You never know what they're going to tease out. They don't know exactly what to tell you. So you've got to just play along, pull out any information that you can, continue to ask questions, and just let them feel better about you know what you're you're doing. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And the other part of it is uh, because sometimes there's so much to say, right? They, they've been to nine providers in the past and they haven't got the answers that they're looking for. So they come to you and they just want to vomit out everything that's going on, right? I always will preface my interview with, I'm going to ask you specific questions. I want you to answer the question and then we'll move on to the next question. If there's anything we missed, I'll save some time at the end of the interview to fill in the blanks. But if you can organize it in a pattern that allows you to kind of follow the algorithm, um, you know, if you're new to this following the algorithm, and if you're not so new to this, then being able to place the puzzle pieces in your head and see which direction you need to go in next, it's really helpful to just warn the patient, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, because you can have an interview go for even an hour. Yeah, you have to, there, there's a nice balance that you have to follow there. You have to not be afraid to get the patient back on track. Uh, because there is a lot of emotional aspect tied to this. And, you know, some patients can get very upset with this and want to go into other topics. And don't be afraid to keep them on track because you're going to help them out better if you can kind of focus in on exactly what's going on and setting, instead of letting them talk away the entire evaluation session. So it's, it's very good to sit back and listen, but make sure that you keep it structured. Make sure you keep the patient on target and just uh, make sure you get the information that you need. Yeah, and one other thing here, if you're a patient that's listening, try to come uh, prepared to your appointment. Know the types of questions based on what we just talked about that your healthcare provider should be asking. Jot some notes down, keep a log, whatever it is to help keep you organized, because that will really make or break, I don't want to say break, that will really help your your clinician determine which direction to go in. So here would actually be a really great time to mention the vestibular conference that the Vestibular Disorders Association is putting on during Balance Awareness Week. This is the whole week from the 14th to the 18th. There'll be presentations each day by a, a clinician or a professional presenting on a topic followed by a patient panel related to that topic. And on Monday, September 14th, Um, Dr. Kimberly Bell will be giving a presentation on how to navigate the healthcare system as a dizzy patient. So it's going to be a full 40 minute um, presentation about, you know, who you should see, what providers are the best to kind of navigate with, how to prepare for your session with that, with that professional, what things that you should be tracking at home to be more concise and how to describe your symptoms. It is definitely worth um, listening to. You can either tune in live or you can um, touch back in with that event any part any point during the day. 
Um, you can register for that on vestibular.org, which we'll also link in the show notes. Um, but be sure to check it out because, I mean, I've seen the presentation and it's, it's looking <laughs> really, really good. It's got a lot of great, um, useful uh, information in that. So be sure to check that out. That's Monday, September 14th. Also be sure to check out the other presenters during the week. We've got a lot of great topics lined up and we actually will be live streaming every night after each presentation to kind of give you guys a recap as to what was presented, what information was covered and what our thoughts are about it. So we're, we're trying to get a little bit more active on here and we're really excited to kind of dive in and bring you guys more information. Yes, and we'll also be active, and this is one of the great parts about the virtual conference, I think. Danny and I will also be active on a patient forum in which you have the opportunity to ask any questions, whether it's within the, uh, within the session, within the presentation, or outside of the presentation, if something comes to mind about navigating the healthcare system, for example. Danny and I will be on the back end, along with some other healthcare professionals, to help get your questions answered. Hey, Abby, do you want to play a game? What kind of game are you thinking? Well, how about I pretend to be a patient and you can interview me and we'll see if you come up with my differential diagnosis. Okay, challenge accepted. All righty, let's get started. So first, tell me a little bit about why you're here, Danny. What's going on? Oh my goodness. It was like two days ago. I woke up and just the room was just spinning. It was just spinning all over the place and it just, it wouldn't stop. I, I had to close my eyes. I felt sick. I was just vomiting everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, Danny, does it, when did the spinning come on? Was it when you sat up from bed? Were you still lying in bed? Did oh, no, no, no. I just over? opened my eyes and everything was just going. It, it just was going. I don't, I don't even know. I, I just, it was terrible. It woke me up out of the blue. I'm telling How you, it was like it four last? o'clock. Oh, it just, it didn't stop. It, it just kept stop. going and going. I mean, the first day was horrible and probably didn't st slow down until like the next day. I didn't even leave my bed. Not even Is this once. the first time this has happened? Yeah, this has never happened before. I thought I was dying. I thought I should have gone to the hospital, that I was having a stroke. I didn't know what to do, but it was it was really scary. I apologize for laughing. This is not funny. But <laughs> okay, so what we have here, right? Danny is lying in bed. She wakes up. She hasn't changed positions at all, but she is experiencing some crazy vertigo. She's never had it before. It's not going away. Danny. Do you notice any changes in your hearing? Is anything muffled? Are you having uh, difficulty hearing more from one side versus the other? I don't know. The room is just spinning. It's horrible. I, I don't. I don't know if there's any difference in my hearing. I don't think so. Okay. So as a clinician, we're thinking her initial. I mean, what was that? Maybe five sentences. Her initial um, report. We're thinking this is probably something like vestibular neuritis. Right. But if we then do a quick test of her ear, her hearing or she has a more formal exam and we find out that her hearing is affected, we're thinking with just this presentation that she's described so far, we're going to be leaning more toward labyrinthitis, where both the vestibular apparatus and the cochlea are affected. Very good. So let's continue on then. Maybe Danny has more than one thing going on. So let's oh. fast forward now. Let me tell you. Okay, you. go. You know, go, ever since you know the, the the room stopped spinning, right? The room isn't spinning violently anymore. I, I definitely feel off on my feet. And now every time I lay down in bed, everything spins, but just for a couple of seconds. If I just lay down and sit still, it'll go away. Okay. And what happens if you then return back to sitting? Oh, room again starts spinning. So I just don't lay down anymore. I just I just like sleeping propped up in about four or five <laughs> pillows, and we're good. It doesn't happen anymore since then. Okay, so now with what Danny's reporting, it's very clearly positional. It lasts for a few seconds, and we're thinking one of the most common vestibular disorders, BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Danny is an example that honestly occurs more often than you might think where multiple diagnoses are impacting this patient's symptoms. Whether the neuritis came first, that vestibular nerve was affected and led to the BPPV, possibly. We don't really have a way to know this, but you see that often. 
Yeah, I've actually had a bunch of patients with this. Um, uh, there's a couple really strong ones that come to mind. And this is a type of a situation where you, I want to stress, at least me, that you should always, always, always check positional testing on mm -hmm. your patients because it is more common than you think that they're going to end up with some sort of beep and BV. I, on those patients that I found beep and BV with an, an acute neuritis or labyrinthitis, I was dumbfounded when I laid them back and all of a sudden they had this horrible posterior canal involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just another layer that added on. I mean, I saw a guy, the first time I ever saw this happen, I'll never forget it. He came in, I mean, day one acute, third degree beating the stagmus in room light. And sure enough, I went to go lay him back in a Dix Hall Pike and he had a horrible right posterior canal issue. So please, please, please make sure you're still doing your positional testing, even though it might seem like a really straightforward neuritis, labyrinthitis, some sort of like a peripheral hypofunction. Make sure you're doing multiple tests. <laughs> Yeah. So obviously Danny knows exactly how a patient with neuritis or labyrinthitis or BPPV is going to present. So she readily handed me that information on a silver <laughs> platter. But as a clinician, you just want to make sure you're asking what the symptoms are. Describe the symptoms. I'm dizzy. Well, describe your dizziness mm -hmm. because my dizziness might mean unsteadiness, but Danny's dizziness might be my whole world is spinning. Yeah, I use a lot of different types of, of descriptions for dizziness. Uh, there's vertigo, which is the false sensation of movement when there is no movement. Room spinning or tilting or rocking, right? That's all vertigo. You've got um, imbalance where you look drunk. You've got disequilibrium where you feel internally like you're off, but you might not present that way. Mm -hmm. You've got more of a dizziness that's faint or lightheaded. Um, that's more cardiac or blood pressure related. And then you also have a, dizzy, a type of dizziness that might be brought on by stress, anxiety, like heart racing, panic attack type dizziness. So be sure to tease that out too. Um, don't be afraid to ask and really dig into more about what they mean. Get the patient to describe exactly how they're feeling. Even with beep and BB, if you can ask them if they're on a Ferris wheel or a merry-go-round, you might be able to identify the canal involvement right then and there. Yeah, so true. So true. All right, Danny. Well, the good news is you're in the right place. <laughs> I can help you. I'm in good hands. What can I say? <laughs> well, All thanks right. for playing along, Abby. That was uh, obviously a little bit of a dramatization on my part and <laughs> not a reflection on any specific patient at all. Just we're having fun with it. And I appreciate you kind of laughing along with me. Thank you again for listening. Uh, be sure to check out all of the show notes for all of the great links that we were telling you about. And we will talk to you guys next week. Thanks, guys. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos, blogs, continuing education classes, and resources including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBV treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.